We are continuing uh, uh, in our study in the Ten Commandments, understanding them as foundational to many of the things we're doing in life. Uh, our whole life is uh, living out the truth of the redemption we have in the Messiah. How we live out that redemption is according to God's word. Uh, we don't live out that redemption according to our own will, our own ideas, our own preferences. No, that may have been more of the problem than the solution. But we live out the redemption, the salvation that we have in the Messiah through uh, the truth of his word. And therefore the word of God becomes a lamp unto our feet to lighten our path. Uh, and so in the Ten Commandments, we're seeing the foundation blocks uh, for the rest of the Bible, as we've noted before. Uh, last week, we started on the fourth command. We're taking three weeks to cover it, because as I noted last week, of all the commands, this one has the most words, even though this may get the least attention in some places. Of all the commands, this one is the one that has the most words in the text which gives us an idea that maybe God wants us to give it some time in our considerations. And so last week looked at verse 8 in Exodus 20. Now we'll take a look at the next two verses, uh, verse 9 and 10, as we consider the matter of Shabbat. Uh, we have several portions of scripture, uh, and I'd like us to read it. We read it last week. You did great, but let's see how we do this week with the women back. Uh, and if it's up to, uh, if you're able to, uh, please stand up right where you are, uh, that we might read it in unison. Why are we standing? To honor the word. But if you can't stand, that's quite all right. Honor him in your heart. Uh, we'll read three slides. Let's start from Exodus 20. I am Hashem your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you will labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Hashem your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days Hashem made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Hashem blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I am Hashem your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as Hashem your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Hashem your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you so that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and Hashem your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Hashem your God commanded you today to observe the Sabbath day. But as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am Hashem who sanctifies you. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days Hashem made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. Avinu, we are thankful for your word, which teaches us how to rest, how to honor you, how to live out the life we were created to live, the life we receive in abundance through the redemption of our Messiah, the salvation by faith in Yeshua. And so help us to study the word in a way that we might make application for our lives to both honor you and to make a difference in the world around us. So add your blessing to our considerations that we might have that rest in Messiah, 
And therefore we pray for those in our community that need that rest, not only those who have not yet come to personal faith in the Messiah, but for those that are going through difficulties. We think especially of our sister Tali, recuperating after surgery. May your blessing of healing be upon her and upon others who need your blessing and encouragement. We pray as well for our lives, that we would be pleasing in your sight. Your name might be honored in us and through us. For we ask this in Messiah's name. Amen. Please be seated, if you will. As we consider uh, the section today, we looked last week, uh, we looked at quite a bit of detail in that verse 8. Uh, the scripture is just so rich in truth. Need some time to unpack it. And so we learned uh, that God's rest that comes in God, you say, I thought it was Shabbat. No, uh, Shabbat pictures that rest. It typifies that rest. Uh, but it does not give you that rest. Uh, I grew up in a, kind of a religious Jewish home, and we observe Shabbat every, every week. Uh, but that, and went to shul every week, etc. Uh, but never had rest until I came to personal faith in the Messiah, the Lord of the Sabbath, Adon HaShabbat. In him there is rest, and therefore the day has a, uh, it testifies, it symbolizes, it signifies the very rest that we have in him. And so we learn that the true rest for us is increasingly enjoyed as we remember to set it apart. And remember what we learned last week, as we set something apart unto God, we are set apart unto God in that regard. That we are set apart and we grow in our maturity, spiritual maturity in the holiness of God, etc. Just like when you dedicate your children to the Lord, it's really the parents that are being dedicated to raise the children in the Lord. Uh, so they are set apart by dedicating their kids. Well, this sanctifying work, this is what matures us in our relationship, that is an eternal relationship uh, with the Lord our God. Uh, he's the one who blesses us, he loves us, he's given us all that we can never, beyond what we can hope or think in the Messiah of Israel. And so, uh, we, as we noted last week, the restoring rest uh, by restoring relationship with the rest giver. As we move on, we want to understand that God redeemed his people for a purpose. It was not just to deliver them from hell. You say, that's like a big deal for me. Yeah, I appreciate the matter. Uh, but to God, there was something more important than just delivering any of us from the eternal judgment we deserve. He delivers us, saves us, so we might relate to him. That's the fullness of life. The fullness of life is not because you got your ticket punched to you know, get out of hell free card or something like that. It's because you have a relationship with the Lord. That brings fullness of life. That's what God intended, uh, not only to deliver us from the judgment we deserve, because Yeshua took our judgment, but to give us the true meaning of life as well in himself. And so uh, we have a weekly reminder of that true rest uh, as we intentionally, faith is intentional. Faith is intentional. You say, well, sometimes I just like to go with the flow. I don't want to be intentional. That's called backsliding. That happens, it's like gravity, happens automatically. You have to press to a mark of a high calling here. You have to believe God uh, all the time, it turns out. And so uh, we want to remember as his redeemed people uh, that we are headed to spend eternity with the Lord of the Sabbath, Adon HaShabbat, the Lord of the Sabbath. We saw that Yeshua, uh, this is, refers to Yeshua three times in the Good News accounts. Uh, so if somebody is going to say, well, isn't he the Lord of Tuesdays? Well, of course, he's the Lord of every day. But he actually profiled Shabbat by saying he's the Lord of the Shabbat. Uh, let's give credit to whom credit is due. 
okay? Uh, so we want to understand uh, what the Shabbat was. Last week we noted that in the Bible, the days of the week don't have names, they're all numbered. All six days of the week are numbered. The only day of the week with a name is Shabbat. And therefore, all the days are intended to lead us to Shabbat. And we know this as well, this is in the plan of God, that the Shabbat, even as we had read and will recite at the end of our time together, the Shabbat is a sign that God has for us uh, Le'olam, to eternity, a sign to eternity. So every Shabbat leads us to that time when we'll be with him forever, uh, when his name is one and we're all gloriously rejoicing in his presence, etc. Uh, and so the Shabbat has this purpose, moving us ahead, renewing in us the very focus of where we're going and why we're called as we're called. And so uh, in Shabbat, uh, the redeemed, we learn how to redeem the time. Uh, the new covenant, as we have noted, uh, mentions redeeming the time for the days are evil. Now, some people say, well, what? The days are evil? What kind of morose life? What, you depressed personality? Uh, everything is bad and negative and uh, not just the way it is. Uh, all have sinned and fallen short. Uh, this whole world system is oriented against God. Uh, the whole world lies under the influence of the evil one. The only time that is not evil is the time we redeem to the glory of God. All the rest of the time is counted by God as evil. The only time that is not evil in your life is the time that by faith, you live for God, you redeem that time. And the Shabbat was put in there to help us to understand about redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. And so, as we study this next section, verse 9 and 10, uh, we'll see that the Shabbat reminds us that to truly rest in the Lord, we must cease from all self-serving, self-centered, uh, self-beneficial activity. Trusting wholly in the Lord of the Sabbath, Adon HaShabbat, our Messiah. And so now we look at the outlines in your bulletin. Uh, the two points we'll look at right now. You have the full outline for the three weeks in your bulletin by just having what we cover for today. The redeemed sanctify the Shabbat by regulating their work for him. Uh, the redeemed have a time for service and the redeemed have a testimony in the Shabbat. And so let's take a look at it right from the top, working our way through. Uh, verse 9, as we consider the very matter of regulating our work for him, as we sanctify, set apart the Shabbat. God said in the word, uh, this is the word of God, six days you will labor and do all your work. And so we want to understand, for, there are many people here, I've had so many discussions on this over the decades, I've been a believer, where they're willing to give credit for the seventh day being Shabbat. But as far as they're concerned, the other six days have nothing to do with God. God doesn't look at things the way we do. I'll tell you that. And so the redeemed have a regulated time for service with a six-day work. The Bible talks about a six-day work week. Why? What is God like, a, you know, what is he trying to do? Uh, well, God assumes that his redeemed people have two things going for them. They are both hardworking people and a holy people. A hardworking people that will redeem the six days by working. Uh, the Bible doesn't know of a two-day weekend. It, it, this is a fabrication. Uh, probably came out of the fact that the Sabbath and Sunday were like two days that everyone was fighting over, so they said, okay, we'll just have a two-day weekend. Uh, but humanity looks for any excuse not to do anything, to tell you the truth. And so, uh, in some countries, they're moving to a three- and four-day uh, weekend, uh, with some of us are saying, yes, <laughs> you know, yes. Uh, and many of you may be looking forward to a retirement 
uh, so you can basically live out the, the laziness that you've been holding in check for like 40 years or something. Well, mazel tov on your ability to restrain your inclinations. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, that God has, you know, when we look at labor, we think of it, we look at it like a necessary evil. As it's something, well, you got to work, you know. The Bible doesn't understand that. It doesn't talk. The, who was the first person to labor in the Bible? God. And on the Shabbat, the seventh day, he ceased from his labors. Work is godly. It's not a necessary evil. When you think of it that way, you can't redeem the time at work. You can't redeem the time at work when you think you're involved in a necessary evil. You're not involved in evil. You shouldn't be involved in evil. You're here to redeem the time, whether you're at work or on Shabbat, but understand the way the Bible reads. So in God's point of view, his people are both hardworking and holy as we set aside the Shabbat uh, for him. And even as the new covenant has in passing, there are six days that people ought to work. Uh, and so I'm not going to judge anyone for any days off. Uh, I'm certainly no one to judge those things at all. Uh, but nonetheless, I encourage you to see your life as being productive in him and live your life uh, to glorify him in all your ways. And so when we take a look at the words that he uses here, uh, the word uh, labor, avad, uh, we get the word slave from this. Uh, so this, has a, uh, this is a kind of labor that has no immediate benefit. In other words, uh, if you're a farmer, uh, like Carrie, uh, you plant seeds, but there's no immediate benefit. You can look at the seeds, come on, I'm hungry. It doesn't help. You're going to have to wait until months go by. You know, you'll starve to death by the time that thing bears fruit. What do you mean? Well, there's no immediate benefit, but that is a labor that you're involved in. Also, the other word that is used in this verse, and do all your work, milcha, uh, this is a work that has to do with immediate benefit for yourself. Like, I'm going to make myself a yummy dessert. Yes. You know, or whatever else I can do to please myself and really have a good time in life. Well, those are the two things, whether they don't have immediate benefit or have an immediate benefit, those are the things that the Bible speaks of abstaining from on the Shabbat. Uh, you say, well, what do you mean? Anything that is of self-benefit is halted to reorient your life around the Lord, to reorient your life from self-benefit. Because you'll probably notice that most of your time, your talent, and your treasure is spent on self-benefit, on what serves your purposes, on what's in your best interests. Well, let me tell you what is really in your best interest is to have a day when you reorient your life around the Lord, honor Him as the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, this is in the best interest of the people of God. And so, for some mature believers, uh, we live every single day unto the Lord. We don't necessarily uh, have much, so whatever we're doing, it's to live for the Lord God. Uh, we think that way, we try to live even more so that way, with all our time, our talent, and our treasure. But I want to just be careful of any sense of judgment. We are a community that does not, we believe Yeshua took our judgment, uh, and so I want to mention, remember the principle. The Torah was not given to redeem people. It was given to a redeemed people. They're already redeemed and set free in order to follow God. Uh, and so not everyone's that free. Not everyone is that free. There are some people uh, that would love to have uh, a, a Shabbat to just honor God and orient their life, but their job demands that they work on a Saturday uh, and uh, they realize I'm not that free. I, I, I'm just not that free. And so we want to recognize that, yeah, 
Uh, we recognize that you're not that free. We don't hold you in judgment because when we were in bondage in Egypt, we could not keep Shabbat either. That's what it's like to be in bondage. And so if uh, you're in bondage in such a fashion, unable to have a job that gives you that time to honor the Lord, honor Shabbat, we, our hearts go out to you. We do not judge you. Uh, we want to be here for you and trust that God will bless you as you live for him uh, in that regard. And so uh, we move along understanding uh, what we come to the second aspect in verse 10 now. Uh, not only that we have regulated our time for service, uh, but in so doing, we now have a testimony for Shabbat. At the seventh day, Shabbat acknowledges his lordship. Uh, next week will be a bit edgier, I have to confess. Next week will probably be much more controversial as we consider uh, the issue of whether a seventh day Shabbat is still a new covenant teaching or what. Uh, we'll take a look at the issues of whether it was changed to something else or not. Uh, but this week, it's, you can still relax. You can, you know, yeah, it, it's it's going to be cool. You'll be able to roll with this. Here you go. And so uh, the seventh day acknowledges his lordship. The seventh day was not chosen by David Taylor or by David Nixon or any other David available. It was chosen by God. And that's what we have to get our head around. The scripture says, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Hashem. The word Hashem means the name. It deals with the covenant name, yud Hey vav Hey, the tetragrammaton and such, the covenant name of God. Every time he uses us, he wants you to remember that he says these things from within a covenant relationship. A covenant relationship. Just like marriage is a covenant relationship. Uh, and the vows you make will actually be your stipulations. It details out your relationship and what you're going to be doing and loving and caring for one another. And so uh, the Torah basically details out the Ten Commandments in particular, a covenant relationship, and that's how, how it reads. And so uh, uh, the seventh day acknowledges his lordship. And so we want to mention, you know, there's some discussion, this kind of a preamble for next week, is the Sabbath... Uh, on any seventh day, you know, any seventh day I choose, that that's now the seventh day, uh, the, the Bible would say that no, because the way it's worded in the scripture, uh, we're going into extreme nerdiness. For some of you, this is your time to catch up on the sleep you missed. Just want to say. Uh, it says in the scripture, Yom uh uh, it caused the seventh day. It wasn't any seventh day. It was the seventh day. Uh, and so any seventh day may be a rest to you, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord. You can have any seventh day you want. You can have any day you want. Enjoy. But God doesn't say it that way. He says what is a Sabbath to him is the seventh day. And so we want to appreciate that though we will not judge anyone who worships God on other days, I find every day perfectly fine to worship God. Uh, I am a, a, not just a seventh day worshiper, I'm a seven day worshiper. Uh, and if I had eight days, I'd go there too. Uh, so that's not, we're not here to judge somebody else for worshiping him on some other day. That's certainly not our concern. Uh, but biblically, we have to recognize what the scripture says and what the new covenant does not change. You, you can't find anywhere in the new covenant that would change these things. So biblically, God's Sabbath is, is only the seventh day. And so the seventh day of the seventh week, let me tell you something. For someone like myself, uh, I find this a little peculiar. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to talk to God about it. Don't worry. Uh, you know, I got a whole agenda of things to talk to him about, by the way. Uh, I have faith now. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. But when I get there, we'll talk about it, okay? Uh, and so in a lunar month, in a month that has 29 and a half days, 
I would have thought, just doing the numbers, there are other numbers that divide much more equally into about 30 days. Many, if you want to have longer work weeks, have a 10-day week. You'll end up with three weeks a month, kind of balances out, a lot better. Uh, if you like to say, no, we want more Shabbat, you can have, uh, therefore, a five-day work week and have six Shabbats in a month. That works out better mathematically as well. Uh, quite frankly, any of those uh, would work out a lot better because just on the numbers basis. Uh, but so what is God doing? Why would he choose seven when it doesn't make sense to me? As if making sense to me is like a big deal. Because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. There are many things that God does in the Bible that has nothing to do with your ability to comprehend for a lot of reasons. One of them being is that his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, uh, verse 8 and 9 tells us that. His thoughts higher than our. So the way he wants us to live life is not based on what is most reasonable to any given person. Because he may have different ideas on what's reasonable. But God tells us how to live our life based on what he knows is in our best interest as we walk with him and live with him. Whether we comprehend it fully or not, this is because we recognize he is Lord and we therefore give him the benefit of the doubt. We say, okay, I don't quite get it. Uh, you want me to do like something with my money? Now you're getting real personal when you talk about my financial matters here. But nonetheless, I'll trust you for this. Well, it's the same thing with time. Is he the Lord of time? Or he only can limit himself to certain things that fill your agenda. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so when we think about it, you know, then you say, well, hold on a second. What, what's up with God? All the sevens, you know, you read through the Bible, a cursory reading of the Bible, you're going to see seven, seven, seven all over the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation, a repetition of sevens all the time. What's up with a seven-day week and a seventh-day Shabbat? What's up with that? Why is seven uh, symbolically used throughout the Bible uh, often, well, the word for seven, we mentioned before, uh, is from the same word for an oath, O-A-T-H, an oath, giving an oath. And when people gave an oath in the Hebrew, they sevened themselves. I know that sounds weird. But giving an oath, they said the word seven because the same root for oath Therefore, Abraham had seven lambs that were, therefore, characterized his oath in a covenant he made. Uh, seven is used for oath. So the seventh day Shabbat has significance from God for the oath he has made for our rest and redemption. The seventh day, every Shabbat, uh, is the Shabbat unto the Lord, where he is weekly renewing his oath for our rest and well-being. It is a Shabbat to the Lord. It is to the Lord. It is his oath every week where he is renewing his word to his people, assuring them, I'm concerned about your rest. I'm concerned about your rest now and forever. And so we want to understand when we gather to worship uh, on the seventh day, this reflects our trust in his oath. We are therefore demonstrating our faith in his word, that his promises are true, and the seventh day was therefore chosen by God to be a time of his renewal of his word to our souls, even as we reorient and renew ourselves in him and show our faith in who he is and what he has done. And so as we now consider uh, what the text goes on to say, uh, the Shabbat also affects our responsibilities. And that's what it's going to speak of now. For it says in the rest of verse 10, 
uh, in it you shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. Uh, I, I translated Gerim into your house guests for the weekend, just saying. And so Shabbat affects our stewardship, all your responsibilities. So you and your wife, your children, your employees, your work animal, all the things you do for your business, uh, that can be any kind of stuff you got going on there, all your house guests for the weekend uh, all partake in this matter. And so for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, how many men believe that's true? Raise your hand. Well, then Shabbat should be a way of identifying with that fact, uh, that that is for your house, for your response. You may not be able to judge my house, quite frankly, or another person's house. That's not your responsibility. That's not your stewardship. It is not your place to judge somebody else's home on how they handle things. This is the good news. You're only responsible for your own stewardship. No one else's. Yay! But it's also some sobering news, because you're fully responsible for your stewardship, uh, as it being his. As his. You say, what do you mean? Now, the spiritual testimony of what is mine, my home, my car, uh, my hands, my feet, whatever is mine, my spiritual testimony of whatever is mine is set apart on Shabbat as testimony that it is his. In other words, when you take your responsibilities, when you take your stewardship, and you say, I acknowledge you as the Lord of the Shabbat, I therefore set that apart unto you. Therefore, I'm recognizing you as Lord over my home, over my car, over my hands, over my feet, over my heart. I recognize you as the owner. I'm only the manager. I am not the owner of my car. I know the government thinks so. And if I get into an accident, they won't sue God. They'll sue me. Fair enough. But, and I have to pray that he will be the God of my right foot all the time. But nonetheless, he is the Lord over everything I have. Otherwise, it becomes an idolatry. It becomes a stronghold where the arrogance of thinking I'm in charge overwhelms my honor to his name. And so we want to understand the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in the earth, including you, including what you own, all your possessions and your business and all of those things, all of that belongs to God. Uh, it is his uh, because he is the Lord. Uh, it all belongs to him. And therefore, having a Shabbat is going to be a time of being able to testify to that fact. That's where the testimony is found. The testimony is found in that regard. And so the question is, he, is he the Lord of the Sabbath in your home and in your business? Is he the Lord of the Sabbath in where you go and what you do? Is everything under your roof at his command? What are the areas that are not under his lordship. Those are the areas he can't bless. Those are the areas that appear spiritually as a stronghold of rebellion. Whether it be uh, you know, you know, how you raise your children, if you're not raising them in godliness, in love, in kindness, in mercy, in grace, uh, and if you're not treating your spouse in a caring and kind and forgiving manner. Uh, you say, well, I'll, I'll do things, you know, my home is my castle. Wrong Bible. That's not a Bible thing. That's like some male, strange, weak people coming up with ideas that have nothing to do with truth. No, no. Understand the issue. Uh, what's in rebellion to God is what's unyielded to God. Uh, and therefore prayerfully consider that matter, that the Shabbat, Shabbat might be a living testimony of, of your life. 
And so God's blessing for your family uh, is, is when your stewardship reveals his lordship. That's where he blesses uh, in such a way. And so as we consider the matter, uh, we take a look now at, at the, at the uh, reiteration uh, when we came out of Egypt 40 years later, about to enter the land in Deuteronomy, uh, in Devarim, as it's called, the words, Deuteronomy, uh, the, the, the reiteration of the law as such, and the reiteration of the Ten Commandments, as we had read uh, from Deuteronomy, we see that it adds certain phrases to emphasize it. Uh, certain phrases are added uh, or explained more fully to emphasize these matters as we enter the land. And one of the phrases that is added from Deuteronomy 5.14 is that, oh, your servants and all of that stuff, that they may rest as well as you in the Lord. That they may rest as well as you uh, in the Lord. That's the idea, orienting our life in him. As we noted last week, it, it's not for physical rest. Uh, because you, you, on that basis, you probably would say, I'm good. I don't need to rest. Thank you very much. Well, it's not for physical rest. As we noted, that's why it says that God rested. He was refreshed. And he doesn't weary. He never wearies or tires out or anything like that. He does that because in relationship to his people, he is refreshed. In relationship to God is how we are refreshed. This is how the Bible teaches. And so the question of do you truly rest in the Lord? Uh, what life areas are you restless? And so you want to make a little list for yourself that he might, uh, you know, Yeshua will increase and you will decrease. Right? Okay. This is an area where he can increase, you see? The Lord of the Sabbath. And so uh, the Shabbat applies our discipleship. Our holiness is revealed in our rest. Uh, where you are set apart unto God is where you rest. What you have set apart unto God is where your rest is found. You want rest in your soul. You're anxiety-driven. Our hearts go out to you. We love you. We care about you. The answer is yielding yourself to the Lord of the Shabbat. He will give you rest. Come unto me, all who labor in the heavy laden, Yeshua said, and I will give you what? That's where it's found. What's, set apart, what's not set apart unto him is restless, is where your anxieties live. This is what we have to come to terms with. I know I've had to do that. I do that every day. I get caught up in myself and my own little things, and I've got to pray. Oh, yeah, that's right. I kind of got caught up in stuff. Ah, it's yours, Lord. And the Lord, therefore, ministers rest to my soul. And so, uh, the, as disciples, as, uh, as a Talmud, as Talmudim, uh, we are disciplined uh, to... Uh, rest as we set apart these matters uh, in the will of God by the word of God. And so a disciple uh, is not just a believer, but a believer who applies the word of God to their life. Uh, in other words, someone says, well, I'm a believer. I'm not going to judge your heart. Who knows what people believe? But you're a disciple because you apply God's word to your life. You are under his discipline. You're following his train of thought. His intentions for your life. And so the undiscipled believer. You say undiscipled believer? You could be a believer, but you can still be caught up in your own shtick. And we all grow slowly. We all grow far too slowly. But so all of those kind of things, if you're, where you're undiscipled, not following his word, not being set apart unto God, etc., it's where it's unholy, unholy, a stronghold in your life. That's where your strongholds are found. All your fears, uh, all the issues that go on, uh, all the vanities uh, that have, uh, the areas of greed in your life, anxiety. You say, the Shabbat's going to help Exactly. As you now recognize him as the Lord of the Shabbat, you start to redeem your time. Now you start to redeem the time as you recognize his lordship. And you therefore can be set apart unto living for him. As you more consistently 
apply God's word to your life. And so as we understand this, we understand the applications from selfish work to sacred work. You say, what do you mean? For the Messiah, as we noted in, our, in other studies, we saw that every Shabbat he went to synagogue. <laughs> he saw it as a time of worship. Uh, for, he, and we follow him. From selfish work to sacred work. Uh, the Messiah, Shabbat, was a time of worship with a faith community. He went to uh, worship God, uh, uh, which is kind of an interesting kind of thing, but nonetheless, uh, worship God there uh, on, uh, on Shabbat in synagogue, uh, just as we are accustomed to do as well. Uh, Shabbat worship pictures the true rest we have in Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord, even as he taught us to come unto him with our burdens and dump them on God and let him give us rest and peace in our soul. And as it says in Hebrews 4.9, uh, that there is a Sabbath observance. There is a Sabbath for the people of God, uh, just as it is uh, written. And so we therefore acknowledge as well. And so on Shabbat, beside uh, temple service, and all that we might do in the name of the Lord, uh, there's many things that have to get on. As I was reading through the rabbinics on the matter, uh, and studying through how many different scholars and different uh, believers and different people look at the text here, it was interesting to realize that there are many things that have to go on anyway. Do we have any nursing mothers with us? Raise your hand. No nursing mothers. You're out there probably in the nursery nursing as you should be. Okay. That was just a big test. Although I see a mom with a small baby there. Uh, mazel tov. Uh, and so, and I just saw her, you know, wiping the child and doing the whole thingy. And I see James coming back with one of his kids. And so, with small children, very little Shabbat. <laughs> Things that are necessary for the sake of others has to keep going on. Uh, Carrie, do those chickens stop laying eggs on Shabbat? They do not stop laying those eggs, do they? And those cows, you know, they got to be milked in order for them to have a restful day. Otherwise, they'll be a little bloated, just to say how it goes there, you know, those cows. So those necessary things for others are things that we have to keep doing, just as the Father, Yeshua, taught us, is working on today, and so also Yeshua, caring for others. And so all of this should be quite limited and fairly handled, etc., as possible, so everyone can enjoy the Shabbat uh, when you have those necessary things that have to get done uh, to have uh, some time of rest and reorientation in the Lord. Uh, and so uh, the scripture also tells us uh, in Isaiah 58, verse 13, 14, because of the Shabbat, you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Shabbat a delight, oneg, that's where we get the word oneg from, call the Shabbat a delight, the holy day of Hashem honorable, then you will take delight in Hashem. When you, just re, as we looked at last week, when you profane the Shabbat, you profane the Lord of the Shabbat. When you call the Shabbat a delight, and not, oh, well, can I at least, you know, do a... You know. When you call the Shabbat a delight, therefore you're delighting in the Lord. You see, you see the correlation there? This is how we delight in the Lord, when we honor him and set ourselves apart unto him. And so we go from self-oriented pleasure to God-oriented delight. We delight in who he is, the very nature of God. Uh, it's just wondrous to think about. Uh, we worship him, therefore. That's what our worship is. Worship, uh, worship, we appreciate him. That's what worship is, appreciating him. Uh, we appreciate his word, and we delight in his word. We delight in his witness of love. We delight in living him out, in honoring his name. Uh, we delight in the people of God, uh, delighting in the community of faith, just as Yeshua did as well in Luke 4, 16. And so we rejoice in the very things of our God. We go from self-serving pleasures to delighting in him and rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. And so we go from self-service to God's service. When we look at the, the Torah, 
we see that the Shabbat was like the busy day of the week for the, the priests, for the Kohanim, for the priests. They worked hardest that day. All kinds of special sacrifices and everything uh, for that day. Uh, lighting the fires. They actually had lit light fires, even though uh, for personal pleasurable reasons were asked not to do that by God, uh, etc. And so, uh, but the Shabbat, they did God's service. What they did for God's service uh, was considered okay because it was service for the Lord, not themselves. Not themselves. As Messiah's Shabbat servants, we are also his Kohenim, his priests, in his holy service. That's why our own egg team uh, is cutting bagels on Shabbat. You say, is that permitted? Yes, uh, sacrifices were made. And I'm not talking about the sacrificial bagel. Uh, I don't want to start rumors. They're sacrificing bagels at the hope of Israel. No, we're not doing that. We're just trying to make a correlation, a parallel uh, to the matter that we're serving him in our service for him. It's not for self-serving benefit. It's the service unto God. Even as Yeshua taught Matthew 12, verse 5 and 6, have you not read in the Torah that on Shabbat the priests in the temple break Shabbat and they're innocent? I tell you, one greater than the temple is here, Yeshua, who the one we worship, is greater than the temple for his worship. And so we want to understand we go from doing good for oneself to doing good for others. And so Yeshua said, Matthew 12, 12, it, so then it is lawful to do good on the Shabbat uh, for his sake. And so is the Lord of the Shabbat, this is how Yeshua taught us, that as the Father works today for our benefit, and so also he worked and we work. We are therefore merciful to people on Shabbat. Uh, we want to care about them and reach out to them and do good for others, not ourselves. Uh, we want, that's what we live for. We live out the truth of who God is. And that will refresh your soul when you live for God and honor him in your life and reorient your life around him. This is what it means to be a blessing to the Lord and to make him a blessing to others as well. When we ease the suffering of others on Shabbat and care about others, this is what's pleasing to God that shows that we are the redeemed of the Lord. We care about others because we are redeemed. We therefore are complete in Messiah and don't live for self-serving benefits. We live to honor the Lord and live out that love and that life and that graciousness, that love and kindness that he has for people. This is the redeemed the Lord. When you rest in the Lord's redeeming love for you when, is when you reveal the Lord's sacrificial life for others. We show his sacrificial life as we show love and kindness that he put poured out into our hearts and constrains our souls as well. So as we conclude here, uh, just to get a quick synopsis of this for application purposes, uh, as his redeemed, can you set aside self-beneficial service and reorient your around the relationship with the living God, with the Lord of the Sabbath? Uh, to the degree that you can do this, to that degree you are free. As long as you say, I want to enjoy myself today. You are still trapped in the sin of selfishness. It's still all about you. You think your self-serving pleasures is your freedom? You don't realize the yoke of bondage that you're wearing. You are free when you live for God and honor Him. You are trapped in sin when you live for your self-serving pleasures and not to honor the living God. Then you will find delight in your soul uh, for the Lord. So to that degree that you're able to honor him, to that degree you're enjoying the freedom of a redeemed people. And so the redeemed are set free to live for the Lord. And the Shabbat is his sign of their redeemed freedom. It's his sign. That's what he gave us to show we're redeemed. His sign of being redeemed of being free to honor him and orient our life around him. And so is the Shabbat your testimonial sign of redemption, even as you now rest in him with all of his people and with your stewardship as well. So God can, listen, 
God can do more for you in those six days of, ser- of labor when you set aside the Shabbat for him than you can do in seven days of labor. Trust the Lord. Trust that God has your back, that God cares about you. God can do more in the six days of your labor if you set apart Shabbat to his glory, to his honor, than you can do with your seven days. Trust God for what his word teaches. Your family will be blessed accordingly. And so is uh, the Lord of the Sabbath, is he the Lord over your time? That's really the question. In your time, your talent, your treasure, is he the Lord or not? Uh, Or is there a spiritual stronghold of rebellion and arrogance in your soul that you need to turn over to him, that you need to yield to him, that you need to realize that, no, I just want things my way. I want to understand what it means to live life on my terms. Uh, If God doesn't like it, too bad. Okay, I'll come to some place on a Saturday, but Thursdays are mine, babe. You've got strongholds in your soul. You need to turn over to God, whether it be with the time that Shabbat typifies, or your talents, or your treasures. Honor him in all of your ways, because if he's not the Lord of all, he's not the Lord of all at all, and he doesn't accept second place in any area. He doesn't accept second place on any other day of the week. He doesn't accept second place on your finances. He doesn't accept second place in your families, in how you do things. No. As we grow in him, he must increase, I must decrease. And so we can start redeeming the time by redeeming Shabbat as a day to his honor and his glory. Let's give him praise and thanksgiving even now. As we bow our hearts before God in closure, uh, we want to take some of what we learned and grow a little bit more. We all grow slowly. Maybe there's a, a stronghold in your soul. You may be a believer in Messiah, but there's areas of your life, uh, that kind of just a place of your own conceit, your own arrogance, uh, your own little, what you think of as a safe place for you from God. Don't be silly. God loves you. He cares about you. He wants to bless you in every area you will set apart to him. And maybe it starts with Shabbat. Or maybe it has to do with other matters in your life as well that are surfaced in this kind of discussion. Whatever it may be, God wants to bring cleansing, help, and hope to your life. And if you're here and you've never trusted in the Messiah, well, this is maybe your opportunity then. Placing simple trust in him for his atonement for your sins cleanses you and breaks the bondage of selfishness so you can now live out the life you were created to live. And then you'll grow in that more and more and more. But maybe you need to take that very first step of personal faith in Yeshua as Lord, as Messiah. I'm going to close with a simple prayer. If this prayer prayer reflects the, uh, the need of your own soul, just pray with me. God hears your heart. Just pray with me. He hears your heart. He hears all your thoughts. And place your faith in Yeshua. Allow this prayer to be an opportunity for you to place your faith in Messiah for what he did for you for the forgiveness of your sins and new life and the empowerment to live for him. Whatever the need may be, use this prayer as a point of faith. Dear God, forgive me for my selfishness. Forgive me for my arrogance. Forgive me for my willfulness. Forgive me for my fears. Forgive me for my anger. Cleanse 
my sins away. Through the atonement of the Messiah. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for redeeming me and saving me. In Messiah's name. And with everyone else's eyes closed in prayer, everyone continuing in in an attitude of prayer, everyone else's eyes closed in prayer, I want to pray for you right where you are seated, right where you are. If you prayed that prayer this morning, to have Yeshua be your Messiah, your Lord, your Savior, to have forgiveness in him for your, that you might have his salvation, right where you are. Just raise your hand once so I can pray for you in closing, right where you're seated. Yes, I see your hand. Praise God. Anyone else, just raise your hand once so I can pray for you right where you are, right where you're seated. No one's going to embarrass you. Just want to pray for you right where you are, right where you're seated. Father, you see hands and you see our heart. You see us, you know us, and you love us. Thank you, Lord. Even now, confirm to our hearts not only the truth of your great love, but the fullness of our salvation, that we've been set free from bondage, that we might honor you and live for you and glorify your name. So add your blessing to our considerations, that we might grow a little bit more for those of us who are believers. And for those who came to faith this morning, we thank you for adding to our family, for the blessings we enjoy in fellowship together in you. For it's in Messiah's name we pray. Amen.